Hey, how's it going? So this week I had a thought, which on its own is incredible, that's rare for me. I had a thought, I'm pretty sure that the average person isn't really aware of how big interstellar space is. Now listen, before I even start, I know what you're thinking. Zan, have you been drinking stupid juice? Space being big is like the one thing about space that everyone knows. And yes, I agree. However, interstellar space specifically is so much bigger than the average person seems to comprehend that it is. Interstellar space is the gigachad to interplanetary space's soy boy. And I'd like to just try and convey the magnitude of the difference difference between those two things to you. Let's talk about it. Alright, so interstellar space is obviously bigger than interplanetary space, because interplanetary just means going between planets, which means you're staying inside of the same solar system, whereas interstellar means going between different star systems. We all know stars are very far apart from each other. You are by definition in a different star system if you go to a different star. Well, unless you move between two stars in the same binary or trinary system or whatever, but our system is a single star system, so if you're going to a different star, then for our purposes, yeah, you're going to a different star system. There is also intergalactic space, but the numbers get so incredibly incomprehensible from a human perspective at that point that I'm not even going to go there in this episode. Let's just stick with interstellar space. In fact, I think I'm going to stick with near interstellar space, specifically the nearest star to ours, just to try and put that in any amount of perspective whatsoever. Now, I think the reason why we can understand interplanetary space a little bit easier than we can interstellar space is that if you were to shrink the Earth down to the size of an object that you could hold in your hand, but you keep the entire solar system and all the distances between stuff to scale, you can kind of make a model that sort of works on a human scale. You know, you can have a sun that's like a beach ball, and then the planets and moons are somewhere between the size of like a golf ball and a grain of sand. And their distances in relation to each other are a distance that you can walk fairly easily. You can at least sort of almost get a feel for it. Interstellar scale is totally not like that because as soon as you put the distance between one star system and another star system to a scale that even vaguely makes sense, the two stars are so insanely small that you kind of haven't really helped your intuition for how big everything is. But I'm going to try and do that anyway. Although let's try a few different scales because you might vibe with one a bit more than another. So let's start with the real sizes of things, and I'm going to begin at the sun and move further outwards until we're going interstellar. So the sun's actual diameter is about one and a half million kilometers, which is already huge. I mean, how do you even put that in context? Well, the Earth's diameter is about 12,700 kilometers. Even that's not super easy to understand. Okay, the moon is about three and a half thousand kilometers, which is about the size of the United States, about 35 million cheeseburgers from one side to the other. So you could fit a little over a hundred Earths next to each other to make the diameter of the sun. And because of how spheres scale, you could fit over a million in Earth's inside of the sun if you just kind of poured them in. Most of the planets hover around some number of thousands of kilometers across. So the moon, three and a half thousand. Mars, six point eight thousand. The Earth, twelve point seven thousand. And the biggest planet, Jupiter, is a hundred and forty thousand kilometers across. They vary a lot, but again, they're similar enough you can kind of put them next to each other and get a decent visualization of it. Now what's a little harder to picture is the size of the orbits of the planets around the sun. So the planets are some number of thousands of kilometers wide. The sun is a million and a half kilometers wide, but even Mercury, the closest planet to the sun has an orbital radius of 60 million kilometers. So when Mercury traces out a circle going around the sun, that circle is 120 million kilometers across. But we'll stick to the radius. Okay, so it's 60 million kilometers from Mercury to the sun, basically. From Earth to the sun is 150 million kilometers. Now that's a special number because we use that as a yardstick. 150 million kilometers, that distance from the Earth to the sun, we call that one astronomical unit because that makes measuring huge space things a lot easier if you take a really big measurement and just assign it the number one. That means that Mercury is actually 0.38 astronomical units away from the Sun, and that's kind of easier to understand. So, Mercury, 0.38 AU. Earth is 1 AU, obviously. Mars is 1.5 AU, more or less. Generally, the planets get more spread out the further away from the Sun you are. I think this is largely because the planets are moving more slowly in further out orbits, meaning they would have more time to gravitationally influence each other if they were close to each other. So, naturally, they've fallen into this pattern of getting more and more and more spread out the further into the outer solar system that you get because the ones that weren't like that either got ejected from the star system or smashed together and formed the planets that we have now. So if you get out to Jupiter, that's 5.2 AU away. And if you go to Neptune, which for our purposes, we're just going to call the edge of the solar system, that's 30 AU away. So Neptune is fucking far away. Just to compare that to kilometers again that we were using earlier. So we said that the Earth orbits 150 million kilometers from the sun. Neptune is four and a half billion kilometers from the sun. 4,500 million kilometers. Crazy distance. But this is still 
all nothing compared to the nearest star system to us. The nearest star system is Proxima Centauri. Proxima Centauri is kind of a part of a multiple star system where there's two other stars which are sun-like stars that orbit really close to each other called Alpha Centauri A and B, but then Proxima Centauri is this little red dwarf star that orbits the pair of those stars but much further away and it just so happens to be closer to us than the other two stars at the moment. So Proxima Centauri is 4.25 light years away. To put it in the same units that we've been talking about before, it's 40 trillion kilometers. And in terms of astronomical units, remember that Neptune was 30 astronomical units away. Proxima Centauri is 270,000 astronomical units away, which is a much bigger number than 30. Yeah. So I got to thinking, what's the best way to represent our solar system and Proxima Centauri in a way that you can actually visualize how far away that really is? Well, I figure you want to keep everything within a couple of orders of magnitude of the size of a human. If it goes much further than that, objects get kind of hard to understand. A human's like a couple of meters tall, right? So something 20 centimeters wide is totally like a handheld object, and something 2 centimeters wide is small, but you can still hold it between your fingers or whatever. You know, just go ahead and cradle it between your ass cheeks. When it gets down to like 2 millimeters, if you drop it on the floor, you might lose it, right? It's sort of, it's like fiddly to hold. And a similar kind of thing happens for bigger stuff. Something 20 meters across is just like a big object, like a bus or a plane or something. If it's 200 meters across, now that's a big building. But if it's two kilometers across, that's like a landscape now. You know, it's like mountain sized or whatever. So ideally you want to keep all the pieces of the scale model somewhere vaguely within that range. So I decided to use one centimeter as like the starting point for this. If we scale some part of it down to one centimeter and then see if the rest of it also fits within the scale that we want. That seems like a reasonable way to approach this. Hopefully I did the maths on all of this right. I was meant to be at work when I was just pissing about with a calculator figuring this out, so anyway. Sorry to interrupt, this is just a quick message to say, statistically speaking, you're probably not subscribed, so I'll make you a deal. Press the subscribe button and I won't come over to your house and do this. Alright, thanks. Back to the video. So let's take the diameter of the sun and make that one centimeter. If you do that, the earth would be like a tiny little grain of sand or something. And it would be about 107 centimeters away, so a bit over a meter. Neptune would be like 32 meters away. This is all reasonable so far. But Proxima Centauri would be 289 kilometers away. So we've got to amend that scale a little bit. So let's say instead of the sun's diameter being one centimeter, let's make one astronomical unit one centimeter. That would make the sun like one tenth of a millimeter across. And if you go all the way out, to Neptune's orbit, the radius of its orbit is still only about the size of a ruler, right? That would be 30 centimeters. On this scale, Proxima Centauri is 2.7 kilometers away, which is still a lot, but I can think of certain things that are about that size that you can kind of understand the scope of, but I'm pretty sure that's about the same length as the runway at Glasgow Airport. But let's keep going. Let's say that the entire solar system out to Neptune's orbit, all of that was only one centimeter. If we scale the entire solar system down to one centimeter, unfortunately at that point, the sun becomes kind of imperceptibly tiny, but that does mean that Proxima Centauri would only be about 90 meters away. That's a lot more understandable. And if you wanted to stretch this probably as far as you can reasonably do it, if you imagine that the orbit of Neptune is only one millimeter away from the sun, then Proxima Centauri would only be nine meters away. So you can kind of get a sense for scale. It's just annoying that when you get to really intuitive scales for how far away the sun is, the individual objects within the solar system are so small that, you know, even the sun that can fit a million Earths inside of it is small enough that it actually becomes microscopic. So to me, I think the best measurement probably is calling one AU one centimeter. That way you can have the radius of all the orbits of the planet fit on one 30 centimeter ruler. The sun is one tenth of a millimeter wide, which you could see. It would be hard to see, but you could just about see it. And Proxima Centauri is a bit less than three kilometers away. So it's about the length of an average sized airport runway. Don't even get me started on other interstellar objects. Like just from the Earth to the center of the galaxy is 30 thousand light years. Our galaxy alone is a hundred thousand light years from one edge to the other. And you're talking millions of light years if you want to go off to other spiral galaxies. It's actually even harder because like where exactly is the edge of a galaxy? We think lots of galaxies have huge halos of dark matter around them. Like do we include that? Do we just include the matter? Where is the last star? Because there are just random stars floating around in intergalactic space. So where do you actually draw the boundary of where the galaxy begins? If there's one star orbiting the galaxy ten times further out than any other star, does that make 
the galaxy 10 times wider? Most people would say no. But at least today, in regards to interstellar measurements, let me know in the comments if you think this has made it slightly easier to think about interstellar distances or not. And as always, thanks to my elite level supporters, Thunderbolt 22A10, who invented the number six, Nomad Greg, who puts his legs on one trouser at a time, just like the rest of us, Andrew Mole, who's never seen a goose, John Bejarano, who isn't sure about the whole breathing oxygen thing, JDK, who's got a bitch of an itch on his left ass cheek, Mutantius Doom, who can believe it's not butter, Storm Esther Ritter, who has a vertical mustache, Nikita Lurie, who gathered the Dragon Balls and wished for the will to fucking live, Aaron Rowe, who's gonna take Greenland for himself, because clearly the rest of us can't be trusted, Bonk Chunk, who has an odd number of ears, and thanks to all my other supporters too. Go check out the Patreon or the channel membership if you want to be featured in my video credits or chat on Discord. And as always, I'll catch you in the next one. Over now.